guys are probably semi-familiar with this with this Epstore business. Uh, I may have music to go with this. I don't know. No. Um, business. What EPSCOR is is this kind of national science foundation, but one of the forms, funding of states that get a relatively a very small proportion of the federal national NSF budget. Montana has qualified for the last 30 plus years, and we've been you know one of the original EPSCOR states. What EPSCOR is doing in this program, and what's relevant to my talk, which is sort of my point is that EPSCOR is being used to fund or develop this Institute on Ecosystems. The Institute on Ecosystems, which is kind of a hat I'm going to wear for my talk, is an effort to, to start getting outside of the campuses at, at Missoula and Bozeman and to begin to include other campuses and tribal colleges in the Institute. This, me being here, is kind of one step, a baby step, in that direction um, because we've had this, we've had this rough cut on both, and Bev has given us a, a ration of uh, something, uh, uh, which is perfectly reasonable. This rough cut, uh, we've really organized it to have people go back and forth between Bo Bozeman and Missoula, and we'd like to see it do a little bit more. And we can't force people to go to every institution in the state, but I'm encouraging folks to stop here as they go back and forth between Montana State and, and the University of Montana, Missoula. So we'll see, we'll see how that works. But I'm trying to break the ice a little bit by doing my little rough cut thing here with you guys. And so I appreciate you coming. You can tell them what a great audience. I'm going to boast when I get to, when I get to, when I get to MSU. And the point of rough cut is not to do what I'm doing right now, which is yakking about EPSCOR and the IOE. The point is to share science. So I'm going to switch hats and put on the hat that I've worn for 25 years as just a regular old community ecologist, and that's what I'm going to talk about. So I, I do community ecology. I know plants more than I know other stuff. I have been here to give talks before, invited by Rick and by Chris. I think most of what I'm going to talk about is a little bit different when I look back at my old, old PowerPoint. But it is going to be community ecology. I, I studied kind of small scale sorts of things, plants interacting with plants, plants interacting with bugs, plants interacting with microbes. So it's the scale of community ecology, but to start off, I kind of want to put it at a much bigger scale. Oh, a big scale. A big, uh, and, and it's not this, it's not a big scale like, you know, GIS and global climate change and all this kind of stuff. It's a scale that's kind of really old school, kind of old school evolution. And it's the scale at which these two boys really made their discoveries and changed biology forever. This, this Alfred Wallace and Charles Darwin. And of course, what these guys did is they basically either hung out in the jungle, you know, in Borneo, or traveled around the world and looked at patterns on islands and continents. And both of them came up with this idea that when you isolate organisms, you get something fantastic. You get speciation, you get evolution through natural selection. And at that scale, what we have is sort of really where all of our global diversity resides, based upon geographic isolation and the different evolutionary trajectories of organisms uh, as they evolve, geographically isolated from one another. This is the heart and soul of, of biology as we know it. For almost all organisms, at least in our current paradigm, but organisms that live in this stuff, that live in the dirt, in soil, there's really another paradigm, and that is biogeography is either very, very weak or it doesn't exist. And this is because you can grab a handful of dirt here, a handful of dirt in Africa, a handful of dirt in Antarctica, and get some of the same basic ecosystem processes. And so people have assumed, okay, we don't really have a biogeography of, of, of soil, biota, organisms that live in the soil. It's, everything is everywhere, and then you might get this little bit of selection going on in, in trivial ways. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to challenge that idea a little bit today. There are a lot of people challenging this idea. It's nothing, I'm not doing anything terribly unique. But I'm going to do it through thinking about what's going on in what we might call the Anthropocene, the human era, in which the last 100 to 300 years, we have moved all kinds of animals. That's, that's fine, that doesn't bother me. Um, all kinds of organisms all over the earth in just about every phylogenetic group you want to think of, from plants to mammals to fish to reptiles. 
And by doing this, we have some people created, I think it's maybe a little bit of an exaggeration, sort of a much more homogenized uh, uh, global kind of flora. And it, it, there is an impact, uh, I think, on sort of the biogeographic patterns that have evolved over 100 million years. We're starting to change things a little bit. I'm going to focus on these kinds of invaders. One is because all I probably really know about plants, and two, more importantly, because all these, everything, all plants, are absolutely intimately tied to what goes on in the soil, We're tied to living things in the soil like fungi and bacteria and so on. All of these guys are good invaders, quote unquote, I, my definition. They are, at least in North America, they come from another part of the world. They've been brought to North America by humans. And the invasive part is not that they're just from somewhere else. Most plants from somewhere else don't really do much interesting at all. All of these guys have utterly changed their ecology. They're far more abundant and they have much stronger impacts in their non-native range. And that, this is what I'm using, this is what I use the term invader for. And what I'm going to explore in, in this talk is how these guys interact with their soil biota, organisms in the soil, big black box, um, and their native and non-native ranges. And from that, I'm going to try to extrapolate to you. There is a real biogeography of soil biota, and it's very important, or it seems to be very important for explaining these crazy invasions, this kind of dramatic change in the ecology of, of so many plants. So um, this is just a handful of what's in the soil. There are uh, arthropods and fungi and bacteria. Uh, these are spores of fungi, those are mutualists. Uh, and I'm going to kind of tackle the soil, and for the most part, except for one example, in sort of this, not black box, but kind of gray box. Uh, because, and, and look at, try to look at it ho as holistically as I can. I just want to make it clear in this slide where I kind of focus on how microbes affect plants, and I'm including bacteria and fungi in that, and probably viruses as well. But this is just a, a a, uh, a suite, not a complete suite, of the uh, organisms in the soil that interact with plants. There are pathogens that hurt plants. There are mycorrhizae that both hurt and help plants. There are mutualists for nitrogen fixation that live in particular nodules or in the rhizomes of the roots, as I'll talk about. Uh, microbes make nutrients available. They're a primary source of, of the two key nitrogen and phosphorus minerals. All of these things play a role in, in how microbes actually affect the growth and functioning of plants. We can turn this around and ask how plants affect soil microbes, and there's some pretty much major ways. They can compete. They can suck up nitrogen or phosphorus. They can exude biochemicals, which can affect resources as well, or affect the microbes directly. And plants also exude huge amounts of carbon out of their roots into the soil. And when I mean carbon, I mean fixed carbon, carbon that has other carbons and hydrogen stuck on it. And so that's what the microbes eat. So plants and microbes are kind of have this very intricate interdependence and kind of dance going on that relates both to how they interact and to ecosystem processes that kind of run the world. So microbes affect plants and plants affect soil microbes. And in sort of a black box approach, I'm not a microbial ecologist, so I can really quickly make a fool out of myself, but I do study with colleagues who know what they're doing, the relationship that I just described in a way that we refer to as just feedback. So feedbacks are a common way to study plant soil biota interactions. And there's because there's sort of this loop, plants affecting microbes, microbes affecting plants, which in turn alters this arrow in a different way. So keep that in mind. That's kind of where this is sort of how I'm going to focus for about three quarters of my talk on these processes that we call feedback, plant soil feedback. So two examples with my cartoon here. Well, first, the, the feedback business is certainly nowhere near my idea. Jim Beaver came up with the really formalized it. This Dutch guy, Wim van der Putten, probably saw it or measured it first back in the late 80s, early 90s. But there's two different ways you can get a feedback. You can start with something like this. Okay, so you've got some bad stuff in the soil, and you've got some mycorrhizae, or good things in the soil. You grow individual one in that soil. You take it out, 
And in this case, in my cartoon, it cultivated a bunch of positive things. And all the negative things are gone. Okay, that's a little weird, but it, it happens in something like this way. So now the next individual of the same plant is bigger. That's a positive feedback. And I'll show you examples of these. Uh, they can't go on forever because it would get kind of weird. Okay, this is more common. The negative feedback, right? Where you grow a plant in a soil that accumulates negative things like pathogens. Okay, you grow the individual two in that soil and it's smaller. This has been done a bajillion times. There's lots of ways to train the soil. You can play with sterilization and gamma irradiation and so on. But this is how basically what we mean when we talk about a feedback, a positive or negative feedback. So, 2002, this guy, John Coronimos, published a paper that started to provide first hints about a biogeography. It didn't do it biogeographically, but the implications are biogeographic. And the important thing about that is that implies evolution. Really cool evolutionary trajectory involving plants and organisms in the soil. So what he did was a bunch of feedback experiments like I described with my cartoons. And this is the strength of the feedback over here on the y-axis and the direction. So if they're going up, that's a positive feedback. And that's not significant. And that's the weird positive feedback I told you about. All of those plants in that row are doing positive feedback. See, they, they grow better after a conspecific has been put in that soil. All of these guys are showing strong negative feedback, the normal thing, where it's a density-dependent process. As plants get common, they get suppressed by these negative feedbacks. We expect that. That's normal. We don't expect that. That's weird. Okay. Well, all of the weird stuff is going on with invasive plants, invasive species in, in the soil that he studied, old field in Canada. All of these strong negative feedbacks are rare native plants. Okay, the natives have something that that they're cultivating in the soil biota that in turn regulates their their, their growth and we would guess their abundance in real life. All of the invasives don't have that regulation thing going on. Uh, it's it's amazing that he got such strong positive feedback, but he got positive feedback. In other words, there's nothing in there that's regulating their growth. This is really a, a, a major, well, I said it was in nature, is a major step towards understanding soil feedbacks and the origin of species. Invaders not controlled by stuff in the soil. I'm gonna, he broke his analysis down a little bit more. Uh, these are the same species here. This is the same feedback on the y-axis except he broke apart, this is a good example of not looking at the soil as just a black box, he broke apart mutualistic fungi, arbuscular mycorrhizae fungi, mycorrhizae, and he broke apart pathogens in the soil, um, and then he had sterile soil. But we're gonna look just at these gray bars and these white bars. What he found was, is across both the invasive and the native, uh, mutualistic fungi did okay. There was no real problem. There you got positive growth uh, pretty much across the board. All of this feedback, negative feedback, the regulatory feedback, seems to be driven by pathogens, or at least a pathogen fraction. And that probably includes, though I don't know for sure, both fungi and, and bacteria. So anyway, this pathogen business now, when we think about pathogens, this connects us to some really important other aspects of ecology and biology. And one of these connections is with this hypothesis. So if you're a biologist, or I should say an ecologist type, evolutionary type, this is kind of one of the central hypotheses for biological diversity. Came up with, with these two guys. Uh, this guy was actually on my committee, Joe Connell. I think they're both still alive. And they argued that in tropical forests, the extreme diversity that you find there is in part due to pathogen feedback. Pathogen feedback and accumulation around mom. And so what that does is it makes it difficult to form sort of monospecific stands. And this is their idea. Here's mom right here. Seed dispersal is near mom. Okay, fair enough. And it tails off going away from mom. But seed survival, that's the blue line, okay, is lousy near mom because mom has got, has got things that eat her, pathogens and herbivores. And so there's this sweet spot 
in recruitment, but that's far away, you know, on the other side of this room. Okay, so they're not clustering around together, and that makes space for lots and lots of species to, to grow together and creates a high degree of diversity. Big, big, important hypothesis in ecology. And it originated, there's many studies that have supported this, not all, but have supported this, but mainly from the tropics. Now back to this cool invasion kind of biography, biogeography thing. It doesn't happen only in the tropics. Uh, another paper published in Nature by Alyssa Packer and Keith Clay, they studied this Jansen-Connell hypothesis for, for black cherry, Prunus carotina. It's a relatively rare tree. It's out there. It's not like it's endangered or anything. But it's scattered around in eastern deciduous forests. And they studied the relationship. And I'm just going to give you a tiny bit of their work between Prunus serotina and Pythium, which is a soil pathogenic fungus. Okay. And what, what, sorry, when what they found was is that there's very clear evidence for this Jansen Connell hypothesis um, in the native range. Okay. This tree is spread out. Seedlings that grow next to mom got whacked by Pythium, the fungus. Now, this guy here, Kurt Reinhardt, was one of my students, PhD student. He got excited uh, in the biogeographical patterns of Prunus serotina because it's an invader in, in Europe. Um, and so he went to Europe, worked with that guy I mentioned before, Wim van der Putten, and he examined both spatial patterns and soil feedbacks in the native and in the non-native range. Okay, this is where it starts to, starts to come home in terms of this in terms of this feedback process. So this is the pattern. This is distance from the nearest tree. So you can think about mom being over here again. Okay, well the white bars are the native range. If mom is here, you've got to go to find another sapling. You've got to go 50 meters. You've got to go very far. They're all scattered far apart through the forest. Same thing for trees. Can't really tell much for seedlings. But when you go to Holland, here in the invaded range, they're packed together. They have this classic sort of invasion scenario. They're like two meters apart in a monocultural stand. Okay, there's a lot of reasons that could be. But what Kurt did, and again, I, I wasn't an author on this. I wasn't involved. Kurt and I were actually having sort of a race because we talked about these ideas in the lab. He established this wonderful collaboration. And I said, you, let's see who can win. You go and you do it with this, and I'm going to work with Napweed, and we'll race to see who can publish first. And he beat me, and he published first, and so that's why he gets to go first in, this, in my talk. So anyway, he took soil from the native range and the, the, the non-native range and uh, did a few tests, both with, with sterilizing the soil to get rid of the, any biota, and then growing them in either soil from underneath, underneath a black cherry our soil from away from a black cherry, and then either one seedling or three seedlings in a pot. And all of that complexity uh, isn't really that important because the key things really jump out. First of all, let's just look at mortality. In the native soil, a lot higher, a lot, lot, lot more bars, very low mortality in the non-native soil. Better yet, when you, when you put three seedlings in a pot and in soil that comes from underneath mom, a conspecific mom, another another one of these prunus trees, you, and you sterilize it, you just really, really decrease the mortality. So that's pretty cool. There's something in the soil that's killing it in the native range, but not in the non-native range. Biogeography. Evolution is what it would suggest. And if we look at growth here, for just the mass of the little seedlings in the pot, sterilization almost always, this is, sample size is so low here because of mortality, this is kind of a wash. But, but sterilization increased the growth of the seedling in the soil from the native range, okay, killing the bad guys. If you go over here to the non-native range, sterilization is bad. It's killing something that actually these guys are going over and picking up some kind of semi-mutualist and benefiting from that. So this contrast to this contrast is what I mean by these biogeographical differences. In the native range, we, there, there are pathogens or something in the soil biota that suppresses plants and keeps them behaving as decent citizens. Over here, that is all gone, and it gives them the opportunity to explode and become invasive on the landscape. So this is this is uh, Prunus serotina, a tree from the from uh, the, the Midwest and the East. And this is the first illustration of something really biogeographical and evolutionary 
uh, in, when it comes to soil biota, something that really does contrast with this current paradigm that everything is everywhere, that there is no biogeography to, to bacteria and the microbes. Okay, I'm going to move on to one of our favorites, Centaurus didi, our used to be maculosa, spotted knapweed, the good invader. It's much, much more abundant in its native range, uh, in its non-native range here than it is in Europe. Uh, this is a monoculture-ish stand in, in the Bitterroot. Um, and if you, I've been, I've looked for it and measured it and experimented with it in a lot of places in Europe. This is kind of more its habitat in Europe, kind of a weedy thing, you know, broken down buildings in Romania, but kind of hanging out with a lot of other species. I've just never seen big monocultures in Europe at all, ever. Um, and that doesn't mean they don't exist, I just haven't been able to find them. So it's a good invader, comes to its non-native non range, goes crazy, has big impacts, uh, and probably for a number of different reasons. So I did a similar thing to what Kurt did. I, got, I went to a number of different populations in both ranges, collected soil, and started playing with it. It's funny, this is, we published this in 2004. Uh, this would be hard to publish now. You know, the, 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 the technology, or not just the technology, but the way of doing these experiments has gotten so much better that you know, what, I, what I did is really quite primitive. But there's some pretty clear things. Here's Centauri or CD growing in French soils, knapweed in French soils, uh, and in Montana soil. Okay, could be a number of reasons for that. They don't look so good here. They look great over here. All right. Well, how about sterilized French soil? Here's little dinky knapweeds. This is the same genotypes uh, from the same populations growing in fresh French soil versus sterilized, where they're about four or five times bigger. And when we did this really simple sterilization process, we found differences between the ranges, okay? And this is for a bunch of different populations and a bunch of different soils. Here's sterilization in Europe, either sterilizing soil that came out of the Centauria, knapweed rises here, where the roots grow, or, the, where the, or, or away from Centauria, and sterilization had this big release, about a 50 to 60% release. Whereas in North America, oh, here this average was a release, uh, but, and it was significant, it was just a lot less. So there's a, there's a statistical difference between these groups. Again, biogeography, very much like what Kurt Reinhardt found. I took some of these. These are the different soil populations. I, um, this is probably not the best way to do it. But at the time, figuring out how to do these feedback experiments was kind of hard. I took soil from one place in Europe that showed a huge release. So I'm, I was kind of tipping the, the, the experiment in my favor. And then I used soil from the Missoula Valley, which actually showed, showed a little bit of a decrease with sterilization. It's good stuff in there. And I used those two soil sources to do feedback experiments. Now, I mean, we know how to do them so easily. Now we, we can easily do all the populations. But I didn't at this time when I was trying to discover a pattern. So I did feedback experiments and basically found what Kurt found. So this is French soil trained by either Centauria or by Festuca, a native Festuca. It's not one of ours. Well, it's here all over the place now, but it's not native. And if Centauri trained it, it was the, the plants were smaller. The second round of plants were smaller in its own soil than the Festuca. And if you sterilize that soil, it all went away. Everything is good. Soil from the native range of Centauria. Montana soil trained by Centauri, it liked it, significantly liked it, uh, relative to training with one of our native Festucas, Festuca, uh, Idaho Festuca. Okay, so we got this, compare this to this, that's what I'm talking about. Again, we're looking at biogeography and probably evolutionary relationships between Centauria and soil biota. Sterilization made that relationship go away. So again, this is another example of these feedbacks uh, that, that one explains a little bit about invasion, I think, and also gives us, a, opens our eyes a little bit to those biogeographic patterns, somewhat like Darwin and Wallace studied a long, long time ago. Okay, I'm going to give you one more example of kind of one of these big biogeographic things, but it's, it's the purpose is a little bit different. We still see these negative at home and in and, and positive way, but I want to show you a study in which we tried to break apart this gray box and, and, and failed. The gray box did the explaining, not trying to be a good scientist and reduce 
different parts. Something about the soil biota suggests that these things work together in a way that we really don't understand. So I took another in invader and we teased apart some key components and tried to see if we can peg it on a particular component. The invader is native to North America. It's black locust, Robinia pseudoacacia, and it's become, it's now, it's, one, it's listed as one of Europe's worst, uh, 100 worst invaders. Um, it's native, I mean, truly native to the Smokies and to the um, uh, Ozarks, and that's it. But it's all over North America now. So there's the two, there's the native range, but you can find it everywhere. It's been planted in, it's, and it's expanded. In some places outside of its range, some people think it behaves like an invader. It's even listed in some states. So anyway, um, there it is in Europe. I don't know exactly what that means. These, these, that means there's a lot, uh, and that means there's not so much. But it's all over Europe, and it's, and it's invaded. So we're, get, we're sending our something there instead of them always sending stuff here. So what I did was, with the help of a lot of people, collected soil throughout its invaded range, real invaded range, in its native range, okay, and then at what I call this expanded range. Really, the, the thing that matters is green to the dead. And that's what I'm going to talk about in terms of trying to kind of tease stuff apart. So to make a, a long story reasonably short, we saw that Robinia grew larger in soil from this non-native range. Okay, you're getting away from something. Nodule production did not differ. Oh, that suggests that it can go get its mutualist anywhere. In the next slide, I'll, I'll show that. We suspected that this particular pathogen was, was, was maybe at work, so we collected an isolated fusarium from all of those soils, didn't find anything. Fusarium from everywhere hurt Robinia, and so when we tried to do this reduction with this pathogen, we, we, we failed to find anything. But if we go back to the nodules for a minute, this is a, a phylogeny of what we found in the root. And the reason, only reason I want to show this is that we found just about everything in the, in the roots that this guy could do nitrogen fixation with. In other words, about every kind of bacteria that a plant will associate intimately with um, to produce usable nitrogen from the air, um, this plant had it all. And it was all mixed, didn't matter where it was in its range, it kind of hooked up with anybody. And so, no biogeographical pattern. So again, we're kind of failed in this reductionist approach, and that's kind of the point I want to make. We also tried to just use different components, kind of, well, actually John Coronimos did this in collaboration with us. We, we gave him the material. And he broke it down into those components that I showed you earlier in the, the, in the talk. Uh, and we didn't find really convincing reductionist things here. I mean, I'm just going to focus on two parts. This one. So he, he took apart, pulled out the mutualist, the AMF. You could just pick the capsules out, or the spores out and apply them. And he found something that no one had found before, but it doesn't explain invasion. So th to my knowledge, this is a unique result. This is the feedback with AMS uh, in, the, in, the, in Europe. Here's North America, that little summary there. Here's North, and here's North America in the native range. Well, it liked AMS from its native range. That's weird. Usually AMS kind of do whatever. But this is a, a strong positive effect of AMS in the native range. So, it doesn't really explain invasion. It's that what the opposite would explain invasion. So cool, but this explains in, well, explain invasion. It corresponds with invasion. If you look at the whole soil, not reductionist, but put it all together, uh, here's the negative feedback, which is very weak. We've seen that, you know, too many times in this talk. Here's the expanded range, pretty weak. Here's the native range, very strong. So again, something it looks like it could be controlling it in the native range soil. And it's kind of holistic. If we couldn't, at least the little foray that we made, we couldn't figure out how to reduce it down to something, uh, to, to a particular component of the, of the soil. So embrace the black box. I think probably there's things going on that we ought to, that really do work together in a, in a meaningful way. One last little bit before I leave this sort of feedback world. This guy here in the hole uh, is Andrew Kumatiski, really very good uh, soil biologist. And he did a meta-analysis, which is j just basically pulling together a bunch of studies uh, of feedbacks and invasion and, and tried to and put together a, 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 an effect size. 
And this is the typical model, and these, get, these models get more and more conservative and affect those away. But in this model, that little triangle is, uh, whoops, this little thing here is invasive, the diamond, and you get over many, many, many studies, the effect is very weak of soil biota. And if you look at these guys, that, that's the native, and the effect is very strong. So it, I think this is probably, soil biota are probably about the most consistent hypothesis for invasion that I know of. I mean, it, most studies that I've read that do this kind of thing say, yep, soil seems to have, biota in the soil has a big effect uh, uh, and a big difference between the native and non-native branch. Okay, enough of these feedback things. I'm going to kind of go a slightly different direction. I'm going to talk just a little bit about the effect of plant, uh, of an invasive plant on soil biota. And this, what I'm going to talk about, I have presented here before, so probably a third of you can go to sleep for a little while. Um, and again, it's just a direct effect of an invasive plant on a particular component of the soil biota. That plant is garlic mustard. We are not blessed with it. It's common in the Midwest and it's common in the Northeast and it can do this kind of monoculture thing. I'm not that familiar with its natural history, but I've seen it and I've collected uh, soil, as you'll see in a minute. Um, but it does seem to fit the invasive description. Very monoculture like here, most people would argue it's a, it's a bad guy. And it seems to be a lot less common than this, or at least a lot less dense in its native range. So this is not my work, but this got it started published by Christina Stinson uh, in 2006. And basically what she found is that like all mustards, Aliaria is not mycorrhizal. It doesn't do this mutualistic thing with soil fungi. But the interesting thing was is that when it grew in American soil, it suppressed American mycorrhizae. So this is soil collected from, from under garlic mustard, Aliaria, or where there was none. And if there was no garlic mustard, these measurements of how good the soil is at providing mycorrhizal mutualism. No garlic mustard, soil's real good, provides a lot of mycorrhizal potential. Under garlic mustard, it goes away. It's very, very poor. And what was going on is that garlic mustard is killing, I want you I want you to help. What garlic mustard is doing is it's killing uh, mycorrhizae. And I'll come back to this and get a little biochemistry into this in just a few seconds. Where I got into this story was kind of going biogeographic, as you might expect. So I was involved with all these folks, collecting soil in Europe and collecting soil in North America to do biogeographic experiments, asking if garlic mustard kind of wiped out the mutualists in its native range, like it wipes out the mutualists in its non-native range here in America. So we did a big experiment kind of by science by siege, uh, we got soils from Europe and soil from North America. The soil was either trained or, or not by aliaria, which all that means is we, grew, we took the soil from a particular place like Germany, put aliaria in it for months and months or not. And then we measured what happened to a whole bunch of species that, that co-occurred with the soil all over the place. So all we're doing is asking, do we see uh, the same kind of response in the native range as we do in the, in the non-native range? And this is probably the most important slide. And then I'll show you some a lot messier ones. So here's this mycorrhizal capability. And in North America, uh, when you train the soil with area, you just wiped it out, just like Stinson and all found. But in Europe, you didn't. Okay, the mycorrhizae did just fine. Some folks in Switzerland have repeated this, done, done this in a similar way and, and tried to tie it in with the chemistry of alley area, and it looks like it's a kind of chemically driven thing. If we try to correspond this or correlate this with the plant response, we see something that sort of makes sense too. In this experiment, we just have these two sites, Germany and Spain, and the, the direction of the arrow means either alley area did a bad negative thing or alley area did a good positive thing, and it's kind of a wash. You see just about a little bit of everything. And here's the mean right there of all those spots. The American side, you get a way more negative effects, and this is just on emergence, emergence of the seedlings out of the soil, that's it. And what we see, if, if we train the soil with alley area, we get all these bars going down, which means it had a negative effect, okay? So these two differences were strong. And importantly, this is only for species 
that need, need mycorrhizae. About 80% of the world's species, plant species, need mycorrhizae to one degree or another. Some can't grow at all without the fungus, they're dead. So these are all AM fungus dependent species. So keep that in mind. For these same species, if I make a little bit simpler graph and just measure growth, we see the same thing. Alley area trained at all of these sites, down, 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 is bad for AM dependent species if they're from North America. Didn't see anything over here in Germany. That's a positive, that positive effect is weird. Uh, maybe Aliar is killing pathogens in, in the native soil. I don't really know. But whatever the case, very different biogeographic patterns. And then here's a kind of an interesting deal. If we do this for species that don't need fungi, so things like Elemis and Carrot, we don't see any effect of, 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 of Aliaria at all anywhere, but we, unless it's positive. So Aliaria only is having this. I don't, so I don't think it's a chemical thing directly on the plant. I think it's a chemical thing happening through uh, the mycorrhizae. At least this is what our correlative data would show. These are experiments, but the, the real interpretation is correlative. So one last thing. We did play with chemicals, like I said. We got these extracts from Don Cipollini at Wright State, who works a lot on the chemistry of this plant and others. And we applied different fractions to European soil. And again, this is a soil from all over the place. Uh, all put into the same bars, and North American soil. So there's the control, there's one fraction, glucosinolates, there's flavonoids, there's, there's both of the fractions together. In European soil, okay, there's some killing off of M, M spores, the mutualists, but way less than in North American soil, where this tiny little bit of these exudates had really strong negative effects on, on uh, M fungi, on the mutual. So here's a kind of a cool example, a biogeographical example, a different example of how the plant directly affects mutualists from the soil. One last bit about these kinds of feedbacks. This is a paper that a colleague of mine uh, wrote, or uh, has in press right now. And what he did was sort of kind of the same thing that I've been showing you for about a half an hour. And that is, these black bars, these are all invasive species in our grassland. Okay? Uh, Potentellorecta, here's Stentaria cv again, here's Euphorbia. Four out of the five show really strong negative feedback in the native range. Two did not. Okay? Nobody showed a, any kind of a feedback in the, in the, here in Montana, with Montana soil. Nothing. So that's pretty broad. And then here's the kicker with this. All of these feedbacks were found in soils from meadows, from grasslands, where none of these species occurred naturally. So whatever is driving this is really at the scale of France or Germany or the continent. I would have never guessed this would be true. So the, all of these feedbacks are being derived from some widespread continental group of, of pathogens or something like pathogens, One, except for the fact that all of these guys have relatives you know, in all of these grasslands. So it has to be something broader than just the uh, individual species. Okay. One last thing. Uh, we talked about feedback. We talked about, where's my arrow? That part. And now what I want to do is talk about this part. And I'm going to go away from biogeography. And we just talked about invasions and tell kind of a, a funky story about mutualism uh, and, and invasion. Um, I do want to mention before I get into this, the, the, the little vignette itself, that there, we know now, just in the last five to ten years, that exotic invaders do some really amazing things to ecosystems. And we're starting to get a pattern, a pattern we don't understand. But this is a meta-analysis by this guy, Liao, and was published in, uh, in a new phytologist here. Uh, and what he found was, across about 190-ish studies in, in one of these meta-analyses, that invaders increase net primary productivity, one of these key ecosystem energy-related energy things. But almost double it. They almost double net, pri net primary productivity. I have a, a student named uh, Morgan Lutz, who's finishing, who's going to defend in a month or two. She did this with four or five of our grassland invaders and found about a two to three times increase in productivity. Okay, that's interesting. But there's another aspect of it that's really uh, weird. Not only does productivity go up, so does ecosystem sorts of nutrient cycling. These are all a bunch of measurements of, of nitrogen pools. And there's 
increased nitrogen pools in, uh, associated with invasion as well. So not only are they getting bigger, they're driving more rapid ecosystem cycling of at least nitrogen and increasing the overall pool. And that's weird. And my student Morgan found exactly the same thing, except much, much stronger with our grassland invaders, like Centaurian. Increasing productivity and also increasing nitrogen in the soil, even available nitrogen. Very strange. Keep this in mind as we kind of go into this story here. Uh, this is, was another PhD student of mine, Marnie Rout, and some of this I have presented here before. She studied sorghum halopens, which is a nasty invader in the southeast. That's it there, marching across the little blue stem prairie and, and having a big effect on diversity. Sorghum halopens is a relatively new species. It's a hybrid. It's not, it's not been hybridized by people, but it's hybridized probably within the last several thousand years, a hybrid between a couple of polyploid uh, tetraploid uh, parents uh, to produce an octoploid uh, uh, organism. Associated with the invasion of this thing are really high levels of a strange exudate out of its roots called sorgaleone, uh, that's allelopathic, and a very strong defense chemical called durin in the leaves. And those have been studied by other groups in a lot of places in, in the country. So, first of all, the pattern, Marnie found, um, sort of like what I just explained to you. First, the diversity goes down like crazy. There's fewer than five species per meter squared in the invasion versus 30 and more than 30 out here in the na native spot and productivity doubles. Sorry, that's supposed to be less than five species. Yeah, turn that around. Yeah. And she, then she measured a whole bunch of ecosystem sorts of stuff. And, uh, and for the most part, Things are going up. But here's the ones that really are, are, are odd. Here's nitrate, so this is available land. This is the good stuff for a plant. Here's the native, here's the transition, here's the invaded. Okay, here's ph phosphate, that's the good stuff. Here's the native, there's the transition, that's the invaded. So we're seeing the same pattern here as, as has been described in other studies. But Marty found a very unusual reason for this, and that's where I'm going to start focusing to wrap things up here. What she found was is that sorghum halopense harbors a lot of different species of nitrogen-fixing bacteria. Again, these are bacteria that are able to take elemental N2 in the air and convert it into available plant-usable nitrogen. So she dug into the rhizomes and found that they were loaded with, that sorghum halopense is loaded with these bacteria, doing mutualistic nitrogen fixation. She did, she did these uh, acetylene reduction kind of measurements on the rhizomes and found that these rhizomes do, do nitrogen fixation at about twice the rate of, of the nodules like of a bean. So incredibly high rates of nitrogen fixation. And she had found that a, a way to, to use antibiotics to not knock these things out. And if you knock the antibiotics out, sorghum died. It lost all of its competitive effect on other species. It lost its allelopathic, that should be an I, uh, allelopathic effect on other species, and it lost its itself, uh, the ability to defend itself in little tests that she did with, with caterpillars and, and so on. So in this case, these endophytic kind of mutualistic bacteria seem to be quite key to this plant doing its thing and, and its whole invasion sort of process. Okay, last slide, I just kind of a little bit of a wrap up. We talked about biogeographic differences in soil feedbacks. And the important take home there is that there's some really cool evolutionary messages there, I think. I talked about biogeographic differences in microbe-driven ecosystem processes, and the reason I put this up here is because we don't, we don't get much. I don't, Marnie's example is not going to be the standard explanation. It's just a, a, a neat little story. We don't really know, and we can talk about this if you want. It would be an interesting thing to talk about. This is a mystery. And then I talked about this, the, the powerful effects of soil mutualists that are harnessed by invaders. And we don't really know anything about the biogeographic effects. So I thought I would do five minutes faster than that. Um, hopefully we have a little bit of time for questions. And thank you guys very much for, for listening to me.